Well, may I call the Nancy uh, Bell third session to order? Um, I didn't think we needed an introduction for Professor Schneider, but he said he'd like me to say something. So I'm going to say it has been a sheer delight that Professor Schneider has joined our faculty uh, for the last few years. Professor Schneider, who taught for many years at York University and continues to teach at St. Vladimir's Seminary, uh, also teaches with us and is the, is the genius behind our Orthodox Studies program. In the interest of uh, in the interest of efficiency, I'm also going to introduce uh, the other two speakers, uh, Ian Ritchie, uh, who is not well known to most of us, but uh, has uh, had extensive uh, experience in ecumenical and interfaith uh, work. Uh, his biographical details are printed, and I won't repeat them. But I want to make very clear that he is most welcome to be with us today. John Jibo, somewhere in the, in the house, John Jibo is not a visitor. John Hugo is at home, and uh, it is good to have you home, John. Uh, again, John's uh, bio is here. I think he's known to many of you already. John, welcome. We are going to have just a foot-stretching uh, moment between session three and session four. Professor Schneider, welcome. Um, now that they've managed to, in the interim, to fix this thing, uh, I, can't make, I can't make my good joke. My good joke was going to be to thank Maurice very much for all of his help this morning and to point out that this meant that we had reverted to the technology of when I was a college student, where I made my way through, I made my way through school showing those slides one by one by one by one. Um, I'd also like to express thanks to the uh, Trinity Associates. Uh, this invita the invitation to do a program on this subject came as rather a surprise, and it's really a very great pleasure to think about it, uh, even, if this, even if the subject itself carries with it a number of unpleasantnesses. Uh, Professor Wagshaw was the good news. I'm going to be the bad news. Um, Nevertheless, uh, we are all Christians here, and as all Christians here, uh, this is a tremendously hopeful meeting. We're in a room full of hope, despite the difficulties, right? And we should perhaps remember uh, Cardinal Newman's dictum that a thousand difficulties do not make one doubt, right? Um, so this is... I'm, over the break, I tried to condense a lot of what I would have talked about down onto this sheet of paper that you just got. Uh, so I won't be talking about most of that information. But it is, it is the context of the few things I will show you. Um, and therefore, for, for the first talk, what I can do is kind of confine myself to issues and points um, with just, just a couple of examples. And fortunately, now we have uh, the brilliant new book by Bryn Gifford, or Gefford, uh, on Anglican and Orthodox relations between the two world wars. Uh, absolutely marvelous book, although, if you'll permit me to say so, it's a very Anglican view of the history. Right. Uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding of how the Orthodox see the world. Um, Partly because he's uh, Anglican and that he's trying to trying to be nice, right. and he he could have said a lot of nastier things about the Orthodox. Um, okay, so we're going to confine ourselves to issues. All right. Issue issue number one. Uh, if you're thinking that I'm going to talk about the title that's printed in the program, uh, I have to I have to demur at that. Uh, I'm not quite sure where that came from, but um, the title seems to propose that I'm going to come here and tell you what Anglicans think about Orthodox, and I would never dare to do such a thing. In fact, as you will see when we come to the thesis um, toward the end of this talk, uh, that would be, in fact, totally contrary to proper ecumenical procedure. It's not my business to tell you what you think about the Orthodox. Um, and what I intend to talk about is something a little like Professor Wagshall, 
I, w I want to look for the underlying mo modalities when we talk. So it, it's a kind of history of efforts at uh, reunion or forming a joint church, but the subject is not that history. Besides, most of you know it. Uh, the subject is what's going on? What, what kind of talk is this? What are the values involved? Right from the outset, um, let's say that the idea of reunion is in fact flying under false colors because it uses the two categories, Orthodox Church and Anglican Church, and I would myself propose that there's no such thing in, on either side. Um, <clears throat> if we are talking about communions, yes, there is an Orthodox communion. In fact, there are several, and they aren't in communion with each other. We're much worse off than you are. Um, and there is an Anglican communion, um, which um, pessimists might say is rapidly approaching the Orthodox condition. <laughs> Um, but communion is not the whole story in a church, in a church reunion, certainly not from the orthodox point of view. Uh, there's mentality, there's attitudes, there's values, there's ecclesiology, there's definitions of what the church is. And in that respect, uh, what's true on both the Anglican and the orthodox side is that we are a spectrum. So instead of this um, <coughs> monolithic concept, the Orthodox Church, the Anglican Church. One has to imagine this spectrum of values, and that, in fact, is what has dominated the entire history of attempts at reunion. Um, and both practically as well as theologically, that is, an attempt to talk to, about reunion to one end of the spectrum invariably causes trouble with the other end of the spectrum, and that, too, is on both sides. Right. Um, if you do decide to follow through the details on that page, you will see that uh, the, loudest, the loudest clamor, the, loud, the strongest attempts at reunion have tended to come from what we might call the intellectual liberal wing um, the, of orthodoxy, uh, those few that Professor Wagshall talked about who really did have university training and thought like, you know, understood philosophy and were in touch with modern times. And the Anglo-Catholic wing, again, I'm using a very broad term. There's actually a large spectrum of people embraced by that umbrella term um, from the Anglican side. And this has, generally speaking, whenever it's um, raised, raised up its energy level and become a, quite vocal, um, this has generally produced um, anxiety, outrage, and clamor from the other end of the spectrum on both sides. Um, <clears throat> and the, the diagram on the board gives perhaps some indication of that. Um, as, as you see, I tried um, to very crudely break this up into stages. And uh, the, the first, the earliest stage was generally speaking between uh, church representatives who knew very little about each other, but were terribly enthusiastic and kind of let their enthusiasm run away with them. Um, so for example, Cyril Lucaris, uh, famous patriarch of Constantinople. I, I gave you all his dates just for fun up there. And the reason there's all those dates is that um, the powers that be kept throwing him out and the people kept voting him back in. And it was like that until finally the Turks decided enough was enough and they strangled him. Um, but in his attempt to generally uh, oppose Roman Catholicism, and this becomes one of the principles when the energy wells up. Both sides are generally um, in a position of uh, opposition to some move by the Roman Catholic Church. In Cyril Lucaris's case, it was the incursion, <coughs> incursion of Jesuits who were just running all over the place in the Ottoman Empire, <coughs> setting up schools. Um, 
his alternative was to introduce um, almost whole as bolus Calvinist theology into the Orthodox Catechism, uh, with the result that uh, he had all kinds of arrangements. He knew he knew he had a famous letter exchange with the Archbishop of Canterbury, um, sent students to Cambridge, not to Oxford, because Cambridge was more the hotbed of Calvinism in the period. Um, uh, we have Cyril Lucaris to thank for the Codex Alexandrinus being in England. It was a personal gift from him to uh, the king. But all these early attempts, as we will see, are kind of enthusiasms by individuals, and they kind of come to naught. Um, on the opposite side, um, the English... Um, early on in the, Henry, in the Henrician period, don't quite know what the Russian Orthodox are about. Um, we heard last night from Professor Billet uh, that they take a great, certain degree of interest in Orthodox liturgy, but um, <coughs> as to the actual practices of the church, um, the general view, and this is going to be, what happens in this period is that we get certain cliches laid down that are going to follow through discussion for centuries. Um, so Giles Fletcher, sent on a diplomatic mission to establish trade relations with Russia, um, wrote back an extensive report about the Russian church in which he essentially claimed they were idolaters. And we'll talk about that in the next, in the icon part of this discussion. Um, so that kind of um, misunderstanding of what's going on is very typical of this period. Nobody quite gets it. Um, there were, you heard about them last night from Professor Billet, several attempts by high churchmen to establish a rapport, uh, especially with the group that um, Dear Maiden, uh, um, McCulloch calls um, the English Arminians, like Lancelot Andrews, but it, an actual concrete move was made by the non-jurors, and you heard last night how it came to naught. And so then, kind of nothing happened till the 19th century. And in the 19th century, uh, again, there are several in strong individual moves by um, Anglo enthusiasts uh, for the Orthodox East, uh, working as individuals. But probably the most interesting of them all was William Palmer, uh, who made uh, two journeys to Russia. And uh, they're characteristic, these two journeys. Uh, there's been a, a book, major book on him recently. Uh, the first journey, he just went on his own. He couldn't get anybody official to back him, so he just went and uh, managed to talk to uh, those among the intellectual Russians who were interested in talking to Westerners. Um, so he had meetings with Khomyakov and so on, um, but completely misunderstood what Khomyakov was talking about. Uh, so there, therefore, he went, when he went back on his second journey, with this time with a letter from a bishop of introduction, uh, he wanted communion. He just wanted to walk in and take communion, and he said, this is the principle of sorbor nost, right? Now we get to another one of the fundamental issues. Um, sorbor nost is an untranslatable word, universal community, right? To the orthodox means on our terms, right? Um, the, ortho the orthodox view of unity of the church has always been quintessentially, at least in program, quintessentially simple. Uh, we are the universal church, and if you want to be part of the universal church, you join us. Right? And therefore, if you're going to bring your baggage with you, 39 articles or whatnot, this and this and this and this and this have to be fixed. And then you can join us. The basis of reunion, therefore, is doctrinal rather than liturgical. <clears throat> now, that's a really important point. I'm going to come back to that at the very end. Um, uh, Palmer uh, was f 
followed in his enthusiasm by members of the Oxford movement, although um, <coughs> um, John Mason Neal is almost more, more associated with the Cambridge movement than the Oxford movement. He, he saw liturgy as the way to effect this union, and you heard about that last night too. Um, but the most interesting person was this fellow, William John Birkbeck, who actually went with official sanctions, attempting to set up various modes of communication. And Birkbeck uh, would have uh, probably attempted to refute Professor Wagshall's uh, lecture in the sense that, or, or semi-refuted, in the sense that he tried to draw a distinction between national churches, he admitted that the Russian church and the English church were national churches, and what he called sacramental churches, which were universal. Uh, it's a distinction that doesn't work. Right? It especially didn't work at the end of the 19th century where an almost intimate relationship or, or unbreakable bond was created in orthodoxy between nationalism understood ethnically as well as in terms of state and membership in an orthodox church. <clears throat> and so there were great difficulties in the way. Birkbeck was operating out of what became, uh, for the Anglicans, uh, a fundamental model of ecclesiology. It's called branch theory, and that's a diagram of it. Um, the branches that counted, of course, were the Episcopal sacramental churches, therefore the Orthodox, the Catholics, and the Anglicans, right? all representing the same fundamental Church of Christ. Uh, it's an idea that the Orthodox simply could not accept. Uh, this is an Orthodox, a model of Orthodox ecclesiology. Right? And the one church that is at the, it's not that these churches below are supporting the one church, it's that they're trying to grow into it. The one church that is above is the visible fruit, right? The, the, the flower. The next phase uh, that I've suggested uh, is one in which individual bishops took initiative. This, this started to become a lot more official. So there was an attempt by bishops uh, to make a move. And now I have to introduce another principle or, or motive or underlying value in the initiative and that is that these initiatives tend to heat up when um, there is a political difficulty, difficult circumstances and therefore a need for support from a strong partner. Right. Um, therefore there was a tremendous increase in these initiatives between the Anglicans and the Orthodox right after the Russian Revolution. Um, <clears throat> uh, this particular pair of pictures is uh, for Orthodox re really revealing. Um, at the 1920, in 1925 there was a major anniversary comm commemoration of the First Council of Nicaea in Westminster Abbey and all the Orthodox bishops who were in Western Europe came at the invitation of the Archbishop of Canterbury and these two people um, were marching side by side in the procession um, and within a month they were in full schism. Um, the, man on the, the man on the left became the <coughs> first metropolitan of the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia. <clears throat> the man on the right represented the Russian Patriarchal Church for four years, and then he went into schism with the Patriarchal Church and went under Constantinople. Right. And that represents most of the Russian churches in Europe now, that, that branch under Constantinople. But this initiative by the Anglicans created an external appearance of we're on the move, we're getting somewhere, right? Um, and this then is another principle, uh, looking for external signs. 
looking for external signs. It's the, mo the modality, the methodology that by and large dominated ecumenical work um, practically down to the time of the bilateral com the Anglican Orthodox Bilateral Commission and the Canadian Council of Churches moved to forum. Um, this is a particularly interesting image um, revealing of the point that I have under discussion right now. Uh, this patriarch, Meletios IV, where you see him in full uh, regalia on the left um, as ecumenical patriarch, it is actually an interloper. It, it's a long and complicated history and I can't take the time to de deal with it right now. Um, but he's very well worth reading about. There's information about him in Geffert's book, uh, but you really have to read Orthodox descriptions of him. Um, for the Orthodox in America, this man is absolutely bête noire because he's the one who started the multiple jurisdictions in America. He established the first exarchate um, that was a foreign bishopric on American soil. Um, but uh, he, there's the picture on the right suggests mutual advantage because in 1922 uh, he declared that Anglican ordinations were valid. The first and pretty close to the last Orthodox bishop to do so. There have been others. Uh, it's a very, very tough point among the Orthodox, not for him. Um, he went ahead full steam. He needed Anglican support. And in the wake of the um, major catastrophe of Apostolic Curie, with the Roman Catholics denying Anglican orders, um, each side is gaining something from this. I call attention to what he's wearing in the picture on the right. Uh, you would expect a metropolitan to be wearing what's called a panagia. It's, it's the iconography of the Virgin with Christ in a mandorla inside her womb. And it's a very characteristic emblem of, an arch, of a bishop. He's wearing it on the left. But on the right, what he's wearing is the double eagle. Uh, I, po I point this out. It, that's really unusual. In other words, it's the emblem of the Byzantine Empire. And this is a man who was forced on the Turks. There hadn't been a patriarch of Constantinople for about 15 years. He had to actually sneak into Istanbul. The Turks were guarding the gates to keep him out. So he got the French to sneak him in. Um, individual initiatives are still going on. Um, particularly strong is Nicholas Zernoff, who is one of the early professors of Eastern theology at Oxford, an emigre, part of the emigre community. And um, this kind of thing suggests an attitude which may be a forerunner of the prophetic spirit which is ultimately going to be needed if there's going to be a success successful reunion, the point I'm going to end with. Um, when, this, when the Zernovs, they came by a rather roundabout way, they came through China, arrived in Oxford, or arrived in England, one of the first things they did was to establish an Orthodox chapel in downtown London uh, at Ladbroke Grove, and they brought an emigre artist nun, Sister Joanna Reitlinger, part of the modernist movement, to paint a series of icons. And what they did was to include all the national saints. So the point was going to be pan-Orthodoxy. They were going to get over this national aspect of orthodoxy. There were Serbian saints, there were Russian saints, there were Greek saints and so on. Well, they also included the English saints. This is the English saints panel. Right. There they were. So they're worshiping with the English saints. Uh, a, a kind of Lex Orandi approach. The big exception to my idea that the attempt at um, commu communication, uh, mu mutual 
um, discussion, mutual action, possible reunion, depends in part on political pressure is to be found, in fact, in North America. Uh, we heard last night from Professor Billet about the effect of the gold rush. And uh, once again, uh, some, some of the parts tend to get left out, like the way the American Presbyterians were shooting the Orthodox natives in Alaska. But um, this is all, this is the part of the Orthodox version of the story. This is an image of these two men from around 1900. Bishop Grafton was the bishop in the diocese where Nashota House is found in Minnesota. And uh, when he was consecrating uh, <clears throat> an auxiliary bishop, he invited Metropolitan Tikhon, who was at that point the only Orthodox Metropolitan in North America, to come and take part in the ceremony. And he did. Um, there's something about the North American freedom from that um, national imperial mentality that I think breeds um, a more open spirit, certainly in the case of Metropolitan Tikhon, who was one of the really, really great evangel outreach evangelical geniuses. What he wanted to do was create one church that had multiple ethnicities in it. Um, probably would have succeeded had he not been called away to become the first patriarch and then in 1917 in the restored church and then as a result, a martyr of the Soviets. Um, <clears throat> here's another famous incident. Uh, when Father Bulgakov made his fleeting trip to North America, to the United States, uh, he gave a lecture at Nashota House and quite famously said it was the only place in America where he felt at home, where he felt comfortable. And he had been lecturing in Orthodox churches all over the place. Um, this does, however, point back to my issue about the kind of natural center being between Anglo-Catholics and intellectual-minded Orthodox. You know, moving on very swiftly, um, in the 30s, uh, Orthodox bishops, at least, tended to give up on the idea that there could be these kinds of official uh, relationships and official get-togethers. And um, uh, rather famously said, let's, let's leave it to the professors. Professors can get together and jaw about this stuff all they want, um, and just don't bother us. Right? Bishops are rarely bothered by professors. And one of the results of this, partly from the initiative of Bulgakov, whom you see in the picture um, on the left, he's the man with the black beard, and uh, Nicholas Zernoff, and partly from uh, the initiative of a number of ang important Anglicans, um, the Fellowship of St. Alban and St. Sergius was founded, and there was a series of important lectures and meetings and get-togethers and so on. Um, I have been trying to track down the picture. Um, I've seen it, and I can't find it again. There's a very famous picture of two young students sitting back by the wall listening to Father Florosky give a lecture at St. Alban St. Sergius. And one of those students is Timothy Ware, who became Metropolitan Callistos, Dean Nealon's Dr. Vater. And the other one is Donald Alchin. So two roads, two roads diverged from St. Alban to St. Sergius. But of course, great colleagues. And once again, we have the meeting of the saints in, through iconography. And the um, ethos expressed through St. Alban and St. Sergius um, is an ethos of harmony and um, we can really get together through dialogue and we uh, are the same sort of people because we are thinking the same things and reading the same philosophers. Uh, pictures like this illustrate this. In point of fact, uh, the two Orthodox priests you see in this picture were at loggerheads and in point of fact, when these pictures were taken, um, 
Bul- uh, Father Bulgakov had uh, not just set the cat, but an entire atomic bomb among the pigeons by proposing in 1933 uh, that uh, we just can't wait. So let's take communion. And um, his, his argument became a kind of uh, argument for the intellectuals. You know, we're, we're a special group. We understand each other. So this won't be universal communion of our uh, respective ecclesiastical polities. It will be a special communion of those who understand, limited in quality. Um, his chief opponent, he had opponents on both sides. Um, many Anglicans were horrified by this, but perhaps most horrified of all was Father Florowski. And so, in fact, these smiling faces that you see in, e- in these pictures were at loggerheads with each other during this period. Um, now, I'm bringing this story up in particular because the issue of communion is um, the one I want to end with. But along the way, the idea of meetings of the learned became official instead of unofficial. And you have on the list something of something of the history of the establishment of <clears throat> the bilateral commission. And on the one hand, we could say that the bilateral commission was singularly successful in that it produced um, these important uh, joint agreed statements. Uh, Jean Gibault will correct me. Jean Gibault is really good at correcting me. Uh, But he will certainly correct me. But it is my opinion that this particular one is the first doctrinal bilateral statement signed and agreed to, by uh, accepted by both parties, that actually got reception. But um, even so, if you read the document, it is still full of on the one hands and on the other hands. Right. It is not. It is not that these efforts and these documents really resolved the outstanding doctrinal problems. I'm not actually sure that efforts by theological intellectuals can actually accomplish that. Um, just to point out that on the Orthodox side, for example, uh, we've had a 1,500-year schism between the Oriental Orthodox and the Chalcedonian Orthodox, and in 1992, both sides signed a document saying, problem solved, we got it, it's all quite clear, and they still have not restored communion. So, um, there is some question whether this particular methodology is uh, necessarily successful, and on top of which, and I've listed earlier examples going back to 1920, Every move in this direction in orthodoxy in Anglicanism caused a hassle with the free church side, the evangelical side. So the ecumenical minded ones who are seeking reunion are really caught between Scylla and Charybdis. Uh, Because of Henry Hill, such work was going on with the Oriental Orthodox as well. Um, and uh, finally, uh, the, the, cli- the most recent climax has been the production of this document, which is regarded as the completion of phase three. Um, I'll return to this in just a second. Okay, this is my last image. And before I return to the Church of the Triune God, I want to say a little bit about what happened in the ecumenical movement, uh, partly because... I'm kind of a proud Canadian. Um, The ecumenical movement, um, century-long history, climax in 1948 with the foundation of the World Council of Churches. Uh, At that point, the Faith and Order Commission uh, was just jaw-droppingly talented. Uh, It included names like George Florosky, like Mascal from the Anglicans, like Karl Barth, and so on. And they immediately set out to work on the problems of ecclesiology, which they saw as the big obstacle to 
uh, ecumenical unity. And in effect, got nowhere. Right. Um, now, this is partly because of things that Professor Wagshaw was bringing up this morning. Uh, that is, that the problems in some ways are grounded in uh, habits, in cultural habits, minutiae of uh, practice, not just doctrinal belief, uh, that are pretty close to immobile, except in the long term of history. Um, <coughs> Uh, one of the consequences for the WCC was a, a real shift in the Evanston, the third assembly at Evanston, a real shift toward um, peace and justice issues which, on which they felt common action was possible because faith and order, notice the name, faith and order was kind of getting nowhere. Uh, again, I'm being extremely brief, but in the period from 1990 to roughly 1995, uh, the Canadian Council of Churches adopted a consensus methodology in which um, <coughs> decisions by the council came with after each member of the council um, presented its position very clearly and then consensus was sought. Um, a much more honest method in every respect, honest in that the churches are not being expected to make nice nice, they are being expected to stand up for the truth, uh, but they're being expected to do it with respect, with acknowledgement that the other people in the dialogue are also doing the same thing, so that one has to listen as well as speak. Um, it's, it was quite an amazing experience, I have to tell you. I was there for all of it. Um, and again, to make a long story short, when in 1998 the World Council of Churches went into a kind of structural crisis and the special commission was called, um, <coughs> Bishop Pierce there was on the special commission, um, this consensus model was presented and in fact actually adopted and has worked its way into the working of the World Council of Churches. Now, the consensus model right, uh, takes, a, takes us back to the idea of dialogue and reception. Right? It, it's dialogue among people who understand that produces this kind of consensus, but communication for the sake of reception is equally important. And the question is, then on what basis is uh, there to be talk about um, mutuality, uh, reunion, and so on? <coughs> at a very famous get-together, it's almost 10 years ago now with uh, Father John Hill there, uh, I, I remember the light dawning uh, because there were some particularly noisy Orthodox in the audience. And um, what I pointed out to them was that uh, what had currently happened was that the, Ortho the Anglicans had decided that um, membership in the church rested with in baptism. What the Orthodox, you remember the, the picture, I won't go back to it, what the, the Orthodox had decided long, long ago was that membership in the church depended on doctrine. Right. Now, as I will be demonstrating in the next talk, the Orthodox rarely follow their own doctrines, but they <laughs> hold to them right. very firmly. Um, one wonders a little bit whether, in a consensus model, modern Orthodox who are in dialogue with Anglicans shouldn't be listening, not just talking and going back to the drawing table and asking ourselves, what do we think about baptism? You know, do we really, you know, what, how do we understand it? Do we really take it seriously? So we have, I think, important lessons probably to learn from each other. And, but it's quite clear that the early kind of simplistic enthusiasm and the early notion that you can establish reunion by fixing the externals 
is simply not going to work. Now I'm supposed to also talk about another possibility for commonality. Right? And that is <coughs> icons and iconography. Oh, I, I beg your pardon. The time's getting super short, so I'm not going to do this, but I have, I have some pages here, and maybe I'll have a chance to look, read them out during the discussion. They're from the Church of the Triune God, and it's really quite fascinating how much that document speaks in these kinds of consensus models. Um, it's really extraordinary when it talks about ecclesiology. And on the other hand, um, it's deeply grounded in theologies, especially those of John Zizulis, uh, that the Orthodox today would have a lot of trouble with, I think. All right, now about icons. All right, so I, we started out saying that um, the Anglicans had a kind of topos of, about the Orthodox as idolaters. Uh, this was actually uh, put right on the order table at the Third Lambeth Conference of 1888, <clears throat> a super important meeting. It's the one that established the Anglican quad quadrilateral, but it's the, also the one in which it was declared that a kind of important project would be to reestablish communion with the Orthodox. And then uh, the left hand gave and the right hand took away because it then called the Orthodox idolaters and said, no, no possible reunion is going to happen unless the Orthodox will renounce idolatry. Um, well, the worm turns. And now you can't walk into an Anglican church without seeing icons. There, were, there was one hanging right there in the chapel, the side chapel. Right? You'll see it again later, a model of a copy of Rue Love's Holy Trinity. Um, so these things are actually almost everywhere. You see them in also even in United churches these days, um, many Catholic churches. Uh, exactly what's going on and could these form some kind of basis for a common understanding or a commonality, or at least a common theologizing process? And the answer is absolutely yes, provided that one learns what they really are and how they really work. All right? Now, I previously had a ridiculous half hour to try to do that. I now have a ridiculous five minutes. Um, but I'll, I'll try to give you some of the fundamentals. Um, the point is that icons are theological statements. The, what you're looking at is two sides of the same icon. So you will notice that if you start to do the hermeneutic circle between the two sides, you get the Christology, the full Christology of Christ, the risen crucified one. And that's basic for both of us right this is the whole this is the whole of christianity right up right up there right. Um, it's done so that the ri the risen christ is an absolute statement the crucified christ in this case is a historic statement a narrative statement but the two of them are indispensable uh, christ himself is the same hermeneutic circle it's called the hypostatic union um, the trouble is that the Orthodox have a notion that they, pos they possess um, the secret of icons and nobody else can. You just can't read icons unless you're Orthodox. And not only is that ipso facto false, right? but it's a very important Anglican claim that you are Orthodox. So you ought to be able to read icons. Um, so we won't take the time to look at the bottom of this page, but the top, the top of the page reflects a lot of common opinions <coughs> about iconography, and they are largely held because of the wide dissemination of pious books about icons written from that school of orthodox thought 
In fact, those are almost the only popular books you can buy. So this is what I would propose. Um, uh, we have a course on we have a course on this in our program, and I also teach this at St. Vladimir Seminary. Uh, that what I that icons serve a function that every church needs. It's a didactic, a preaching function, a theologizing function, an explanatory function, but it involves the interaction of the the viewer, the one who understands the icon, to draw these things out of it. The icon is like any text, like a sermon, like the scriptures, a text intended to be drawn out. Think of that first icon that we looked at. It has two sides. You can't see them both at the same time. You have to be active to put the two of them together. You have to go round and round. Right. You have to think both ways at once. Uh, this is, in fact, an expression of the understanding of Christ in Scripture, who is the, who is the image of God. If, if you start to think this way, it's called iconological thinking, and you start to think this way, <clears throat> you will suddenly wake up to how much of the scriptural language is about visual seeing. Over and over and over again, there are six different verbs. There's only one verb for hearing in scripture. There are six verbs for seeing. Right? And it's over and over and over again about image and about seeing. Now look at the last bullet. Right? The whole thing is in that one sentence. The full sentence says that the eyes of your body inform the eyes of your heart. And we'll just skip this part. I was going to give you a little lesson in how to read icons, but we'll have to skip it. All right. And move, move on to this. Um, so you see, if that's what Christ looks like with his attributes, Christ, um, absolutely God incarnate, and yet he's active. He's giving you a blessing with his uh, right hand. Uh, the hand that's blessing you is spelling his name. He is the word with his left hand. Um, then that figure can be transferred to a bishop, and now we have an understanding of what a bishop is. This is one of the very first pictures of St. Nicholas. And so you notice that he's absolutely Christ-like as a bishop, but saintly in his life, which surrounds him. We'll skip this. Um, and among other, among other things that iconography does, uh, it establishes the truth of dogmas, including the dogmas about the dogmatic truth of icons. And that, I have to say, in sort of in Professor Wagshall's spirit, is something the Orthodox have remembered well, and the rest of the world seems to have forgotten, right? The Seventh Ecumenical Council. Um, in these two icons are all of the dogmas of the first seven councils. And that's why they're the two, icon, two icons which flank the holy doors when you're in an Orthodox church. But you see, you can see from this church that you're also surrounded by imagery and iconography. Um, therefore, um, as Professor Wagshall said, Lex Orandi can get you into trouble. Um, and this particular pairing illust illustrates um, the point, several of the points I was making in the previous talk. Um, there is, in fact, a Russian council, 1667, which forbids the painting of the icon on the right. Forbids it. Absolutely calls it a blasphemy. It's probably the most popular icon in all of Orthodoxy. It's in churches all over Eastern Europe and Russia. It's painted on ceilings. It's right. And millions of people every day are praying with this icon. Right. Now, are they all getting a strange doctrine as a result of doing that? Or ex this needs exploring. Um, the reason I, pair <laughs> I, I slightly had tongue-in-cheek when I paired these two, uh, because both of them are hanging in your chapel. One of them is right behind the altar, 
The other one's off there in the side altar, in the side chapel. You can give it some thought. Um, but at the same time as teaching dogma, icons can teach spirituality. So if you look at the dogmatic icon of the Mother of God on the left, and then the famous icon on the right, you are seeing a massive theological insight, a breakthrough. God touches humanity. And it's all done by a simple design trick of making the two faces with one line. Right? It's also a change in rhetoric which corresponds to a rhetorical change in preaching of the era. But that's the kind, once you learn to read the icons, that's the kind of thing you can perceive. And then those of you who are ministers, preachers who have to preach, can maybe follow the church fathers and preach from the icons. Church fathers regularly preach from the icons. So, um, <clears throat> iconography is therefore not absolute. You're looking at an absolute image of the community of the apostles, but in point of fact, it requires our participation. We're holding up Christ's hands, right? And the theological foundation for using icons then is this. This is the passage, the famous passage that everybody calls the metanoia passage. And there isn't a word in it about metanoia. It's not about changing your mind. It's about changing how you look. It uses both key nouns for form. So it's about changing how you look, changing <coughs> your appearance to do what? what? What transformation are they calling for? This is a wonderful icon of the, that idea that the mother of the, this is St. Luke supposedly painting the famous Hodigitria icon. But you notice that the mother of God is not posing in that pose. And so Luke is rethinking how, to, what the theology should be. It's absolutely wonderful. But then uh, the prophetic can, ex can extend to value judgments, right? Um, <clears throat> Now, these are, in fact, very traditional icons in appearance, form, figure, and all kinds of other ways. Um, the fact that Romero has not yet been declared a martyr of the church um, makes the icon prophetic, but that's absolutely an orthodox habit. Um, we don't have a really formal process of canonization. Uh, a lot of our bishops would love to be like Roman Catholic bishops and have such things, but we don't. Um, and very frequently, reception precedes doctrine in Orthodoxy. Uh, this is to show you how traditional this icon by Lenz is. And the original is hanging in um, Emmaus House in New York City, where it's highly appropriate. Uh, St. John the Compassionate downtown on Broadview here in Toronto has, as far as I know, um, the only picture of a black saint in a largely white church. So, um, when you see something like this, and this particular image is now hanging in surely dozens and dozens of churches in Toronto, uh, what you what you have to remember is how it is speaking to you, and if you pick up that speech and respond to it, right, then to use the language of the fathers, you are not looking at a mystical window into heaven. And if you ever hear that phrase, "window into heaven," remember it was invented in the nineteenth century. You are looking at a mirror. And that's what all the fathers from First Corinthians thirteen right on say that the image of God, it's the image of God, is a mirror, right? So your first step in transformation, right, metamorphosis, is to learn to recognize yourself there. And then you can go on to the transcendental second half of the phrase. This is loving God. 
the transcendental second half is loving your neighbor as yourself. So look to the left, look to the right. There is that icon. <laughs>